Last time we talked about the risk and how do we quantify that in Web3 and give ourselves a framework so that we can actually measure it correctly and invest in mitigating it correctly. Uh, one thing that's interesting, you know, with Halborn, you know, we get to see hundreds of different implementations and hundreds of different uh, problems and contracts that are being solved and developed, some, some amazing technology, and we see patterns on issues and security, like habits that you know, tend to be you know, done again and again and again, and you know, they're very disconnected from each other because they're their they're own companies, but we get a, a perspective on what works, what doesn't work, and what's needed. And that's what this, uh, this keynote presentation is about, is really giving you guys some education um, as builders or businesses on some solutions uh, targeted really on, on smart contracts and financial services. Because there's some great stuff out there, but there's also a few gaps uh, that we notice and you know, we're helping to build uh, you know, solutions for. I always like to compare things with the you know, traditional security world with what we see now in this new uh, Web3 DLT world security because we're almost starting over again. All, you know, I've been in cybersecurity for over 20 years and you know, I've seen all the days from like, you know, the antiviruses and the sims and like all the new things and like user behavior analytics and so on. And now that stuff is happening again, you know, starting from, from scratch. And like it's, it's early in the, the security cycle, which is exciting for a, a security company. But they're both equally important. As you can see from the metrics here, this is from the top 50 uh, security incidents involving digital assets it's almost half and half between things that happen on-chain and things that happen off-chain. You'll, you'll get a private key that was stolen because somebody got fished. You know, that's uh, kind of split between there. Maybe there's code flaws on-chain on a smart contract that's purely on-chain. Or maybe it's just the, infra, uh, the configuration on the infrastructure hosting your validators, like you know, your AWS platform. Is that. So it, it's both, and you need to think about both uh, but the way to protect them is completely different. So this is really the breakdown of that. You can see that traditional Web2 infrastructure for those uh, accounts for a small percentage, but private key uh, loss and theft and how that happens is the majority of the Web2 incidents and off-chain. And then on the on-chain side, we have uh, about 12% for the environmental attacks uh, and then 40.2% for smart contract exploitation. We're gonna focus in on the smart contract exploitation because that is what has the largest gap right now in cybersecurity, and this is what a lot of people are developing. You know, there's custodial solutions and a lot of ways so that you can help with keys and you know, self-custody and manage that, but smart contract, it, it's difficult. Um, and the reason why is because we'll discuss like this centralization aspect of you know, the way you do security on that in a decentralized environment. So first, I'm going to step through a very familiar topic, defense in depth. And defense in depth is the concept of layering security. Now, there's multiple uh, areas in that, uh, that defense in depth methodology. One is detective type of controls and solutions. And this is uh, for smart contracts. There's plenty of really good smart contract monitoring, threat intelligence, and behavior analytics. Uh, the reason why is because it's on chain. It's, extremely easy to monitor something on chain. You know, all the transactions are, are on a ledger, unless it's something like Monero or something, but you can really see everything uh, there and, and look at the data historically and build analytics off of that. Uh, so we'll talk about some of the good tools there if, you, you know, if people are looking for that as a recommendation. There's a directive controls, and this is something that we do day in and day out, is you know, auditing and you know, helping to direct them on, this is you know, what you should fix on the code. Um, you know, here's the best practices for secure coding, and you know you can scan you know with vulnerability scanners and you know kind of direct them about, hey, we found this vulnerability, you should patch it this way or update the code. And there's also corrective type of controls. And corrective uh, in the smart contract world, you know, can be considered uh, pausing it and stopping the functions completely, but it's very disruptive. Yeah, there's cyber insurance protocols. So okay, something happened, we have lost assets, but hey, we'll you know we'll uh, back it because we you know, have insurance. Uh, and there's incident response solutions as well. So uh, you know, this issue's happened, we, we detected it on chain, you know, the funds are gone, but you know, they, let's go talk to the KYC you know, you know, custodian or whoever it is that lost it and see how we can uh, correct that and respond. Uh, 
So there's three areas, and when you talk about the, the controls you can provide, you know, there's different phases of the, the life cycle of that business that you know, really it's impacting. With the directive, this is before an incident and before threats, which means like, hey, it's a pre-production. There is no threat yet uh, you know, uh, on that asset. Then you have the detective, which is, hey, during an incident and after the threat. And then the corrective is a after the incident, after the threat. But you're going to notice there's a, there's a gap that's missing, something that doesn't really exist in a mature form right now uh, in that defense and depth strategy. We have an exposure in that cycle, and it's preventive. So this is before an incident occurs on assets that have a threat. How do you prevent that from happening? And it's quite a pickle because you know, you're trying to balance that whole aspect of you know, if you're preventing something, then that's censorship, and that's also you know, centralized control. So how do you balance that aspect? And it's, and it's difficult, and we'll look at uh, you know, some solutions for that. So what solutions do exist right now? Maybe like uh, ones that we've seen, and you know, when you go into it, that with the directive, you can do the auditing, secure coding. There's great uh, third-party auditing testers. Um, there's secure coding. You can learn how to do it. Um, I, I wrote a, and teach a class for SANS. There's a, a five-day course on smart contract security. Uh, so you can you know, attend that. Uh, I think some of you already have before, some phases here. Uh, Blockchain Council is another good one. There's a consortium. They have, they have great you know, courses and certifications. And then vulnerability scanning. You know, the really interesting thing about uh, this open source world is some of the best tools are free. These are some great tools, like Mithril and Slither. Uh, you can put that in your pipeline and do some SAS scanning and vulnerability scanning. Uh, detective controls, you know, threat intel. There's some, you know, Cipher Trace and Elliptic are really good solutions if you're looking for something. Um, and you know, Sim, the whole security event monitoring. We we like Tenderly. Um, you know, we've done some partnerships with them and use them as well for helping with Blue Team incident response. Forta is another good one. And a lot of these do implement with some of the platforms you may already have at your institutions too, uh, like like Splunk and all that. Uh, and then with corrective, you know, each of these areas with forensics, yeah, we have a partnership with Chainalysis to anytime like we help to. We're very focused on preventive. We we try to stop it from ever happening, and you know, by doing some of the detective type of actions, you know, if th there is incidents, we can hey bring in bring in understand what happened, and you know, let the the forensics and the experts come in and help with that. And insurance, there's there's various providers there, different types of insurance too. We've seen decentralized insurance as well. So what about this preventive area, this big hole? And that's, that's something that we had focused on, too. This is that opportunity that we saw. Like, what, what can we do to help uh, the industry then you know, have, have a platform that actually uh, can prevent something in this decentralized environment, but not you know, be taking control and you know, going back towards the centralized, finding that, find that balance between it. And that's the challenge here. You know, so with central, uh, a centralized solution or you know, some tool is you, know, you have that censorship and control aspect that you're now putting on there. And but, you know, if you do something like pausing or stopping the contracts, you're interrupting the, lots of the operations for that. So um, you also have custodial risk if you're centralized. You have a responsibility you know, because you're holding you know, the, the keys uh, for that. Um, sometimes lack of transparency, and you know, you're now taking on liability for managing that you know, as a either qualified custodian or a security, uh, you know, security practitioner that's entrusted with that. Uh, on the decentralized side, the officer side, so that extreme, you have now total lack of control and you know, almost like chaos uh, out there. You're trusting on the DAO to make the right decisions. You know, there's also end user risk if you're the key holder itself. You have a responsibility. Uh, you know, with great power comes great responsibility. Um, perhaps that 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 you know, DeFi DAO governance that's democratized, you know, is just a, an enemy to itself. And you have malicious governance. It's a thing that happens. Sometimes you'll have these attacks that are you know, proposals, and you know, the democracy, all the voting ownership was uh, attacked, and now they, you know, they're they're. It's not a. It's yes, it's another governance, but it's like a, a tyranny <laughs> instead. Uh, and then the reaction time also increases. You have to trust on them to you know, respond quickly enough. So it's a hard balance. So how can we do preventative and find the right balance? And really, I think the main part of it is about how do you, can you create that trust 
in a trustless environment to protect things. So this is a uh, something, a solution that, that we're launching. We have a very suit called Serif, and it's a preventive solution there that we have you know, made some patents for, tested out, and like, started offering to help out with this, this area of you know, finding a way to just focus on where the risk is and letting the rest of the infrastructure act in a you know, decentralized way. So it's called Serif, um, and you, know, it, you can think of it as many things. You know, we, we, there's like five patents that we have on this, because it's so new, and sometimes explaining it, like, oh, can you give me the elevator pitch? Tell me what it is. Like, oh man, elevator pitch, this is gonna be tough. Is it a long elevator? I hope. <laughs> but yeah, you, know, you can think of it as doing a policy engine on chain. So something like Active Directory, which will have you know, group policy objects, and you, know, you can set different uh, rules for different functions in the business logic. Uh, it could be considered an intrusion prevention system. So this is you know, an, an IPS where you see uh, these transactions coming in, and you have a private uh, mempool or a cache layer to uh, you know, inspect it and decide uh, if this is malicious or not. You can also automate that. Um, segregating duties. I think this is a great one because you have this like, concept of role-based authentication and role-based business. And if you're a uh, financial company doing lending and borrowing, you, know, you can have on one side of the contract, let's say you're the underwriter contract that's making decisions to approve loans or not, and then you have another uh, contract that is going to be you know, the escrow. And they have different roles. And they should be able to approve or notarize what's ever in their scope. So you can you know, allow them to do that in a way that is non-custodial, something that is you know, not about like, having keys or you know, authorizations. And we'll show you how that is done in a moment. And then another thing is like, okay, you have this uh, you know, intrusion prevention, and I'm looking at this, and I think it's like a hack or some type of malicious transaction. But I, uh, I'm not an expert, I don't know how to read this stuff too. So you can you know, automate uh, or, and simulate that environment before it, it gets confirmed. Or call in you know, a company like you know, Halborn or Open Zeppelin or any of these auditors to like, look at it for you and help give you a better risk decision. So how does it work? Um, I'll walk through a little bit of you know, some screenshots here. There's no way to do a tech demo, or I'd love to do that. Demo gods are usually are pretty good with me, uh, so, you know, fortunately. But uh, this is Serif, um, and what it is uh, is a platform that makes it very easy for adoption. Because one of the things I notice is there's always like some type of you know, key, you know, signing here. You know, I, I got to do a hackathon in Europe uh, before, and you know, it was like a pitch. I like, gave a one minute pitch of like your, your idea. And it was always like, oh, I think the, the funniest one was proof of meat. It's like, so wait, if you ever like meet somebody in person, a famous, and you want to like prove that you actually met them, you have them sign in. It's like, show, go me. I do is like, okay, bring up your MetaMask, your key. And I'm like, maybe I'm like with a, you know, a celebrity. It's like, all right, sign this with your MetaMask. It's like, I don't have MetaMask. What's that? It's like, oh, I can't do anything. So it's, a lot, <laughs> it's really hard to, you know, it's hard to like get them to, to adopt to that. It's, it's difficult. And now try to roll that out to an enterprise, it's not going to work. Um, so this is something that, uh, that we saw without you know, the non-custodial key. So you have, it supports all EVM, public or private, like Hyperledger, uh, if you have your internal chain. Uh, it is a on-chain native way to prevent things here because it's a smart contract itself. Um, it, it exists on DLT and uh, you can address it and this is where it's holding the policies and the decisions. Yeah, you can have two ways of doing it. There's a hosting your own endpoint if you want to have your own infrastructure and, and you have the means to do that. You can have your own endpoint to you know, send transactions to, you know, for the notarizations, or you can use the as a service, you know, a managed endpoint that you connect to like on a public network. And again, this is the, the easy part, the, the keys. You can sign in with any IAM provider, like if you have Office 365 or G Suite or you know, Okta, whatever you use, and you're logging with that, your normal uh, policies that you have set up inside of your role-based authentication. The private key is actually generated from the policies in your own you know, enclave, whether you use Fireblocks or whether you use Gnosis or you, you know, uh, the one that we use, we use a, um, AWS uh, KMS to generate a key based on that identity behind the scenes. It's abstracted away from the user having to distribute and having them manage it because there's risk in that. So the private key is you know, generated in an enclave in the back end based on your role. 
So how, is it, how would it work in practice? Uh, you have your own you know, you know, chain, there's serifs out there, and let's say you want to withdraw funds you know, to transfer to somebody. Um, so you send in your withdrawal request to the contract, $20,000, and when that happens, it gets sent to that endpoint, and now it's pending approval. It's in this, you know, it's in this private you know, cache, it's get, getting mined or confirmed, you know, waiting for a decision. So get an alert, uh, alert gets sent out, and you know, you know, it can be Splunk, it could be email, it could be SMS, whatever you use for learning systems. Like, okay, uh, I'm the approver of, of all transactions here, I'm gonna go in there and look. And I you know, check it and I say, okay, $20,000 is like way too much, you know, we shouldn't allow this to go out. So after reviewing it, I say, nope, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna reject this one because it does not meet the agreed policy uh, that we have. This can also be automated, by the way, too. You, you can do decisional logic. So this one, I hit reject, and I'm not signing with my key. I hit reject, and that will then issue the command to your key custodian, whoever that is, to generate the key to sign and update the serif contract. So you're abstracting it. There's no more like multi-signing, like, hey, you sign here, and then you sign here, and then we'll call our third party here to all co-sign together, and you know, then we'll make that decision here because you know, we don't want ownership. Like, no, it's just you know, your, your key, your control, but it's done through an, an enclave that is abstracted away from the users. Uh, so you send that in, updates the state and the contract, and then it calls, finally it comes out of the mempool, and the, the transaction goes on chain to say, all right, oh, I have to check, I have to check Serif, see if it was approved. It goes over there, checks the on-chain state, and the Serif contract for that says, nope, this is not approved by the, by the role. So, it then just reverts, preventing it from happening. And it's all transparent. So you can see why it's not approved. You can see what was called the policy for that. You're not having to worry about you know, managing keys and distributing that. You can integrate it with your architecture already for your identity management solution. And you don't have to worry about reacting to, oh man, there's, the funds are gone. I see, I detected that, you know, pause the contract, stop it, call, call the, you know, custody provider, KYC, call OFAC, freeze it, just tornado catch, like all that stuff is eliminated and because you're doing agreed. Now this can also be implemented in a DAO. Maybe the DAO decides what they want to do for it and they have uh, an approved you know, notary, a trusted notary, so they can make decisions on that on behalf and those decisions are then transparent. So this is a, a solution that uh, we think is really needed to find that balance between, you know, complete Chaos and complete, you know, centralization. You know, we want to we want to really only manage risk and prevent things on, on where what the assets are at risk, and that's you know it's a, it's a good balance for that. And it's it's not the one trick pony for it. Nothing is. Um, not saying it's not a golden bullet. You need that the defense in depth. You still need your chain analysis to do it because if there are incidents, you know, maybe Dave uh, Shred talked about insider threat. That's always a possibility, and it is a, a big risk. So there, you have to you know, prevent that with you know, maybe background checks. You still need insurance. So, but this is a, a great solution to fill that one gap that, that we see here in this, uh, in this world of blockchain. So I uh, hope that was helpful here. If there's any questions about that later on, you can talk to it and um, you know, take a snapshot later on of all the other tools that we recommend that we think are pretty good and kind of stand behind for that all. All right, so thank you guys. Thank you. <laughs>